Um, welcome everyone uh, to this launch event co-hosted by Friends of the Earth Scotland, Oil Change International and Platform. This evening we're very excited to be presenting uh, the findings and recommendations of an important report that we published in uh, May this year that our three organisations co-published. It's called Sea Change, Climate Emergency, Jobs and Managing the Phase-Out of UK Oil and Gas Extraction. So I'm Mary Church, I'm Head of Campaigns at Friends of the Earth Scotland and I'm your Chair for this event. And we're going to hear more from each of our speakers and then I'm going to invite uh, any p representatives of the parliamentary parties to make a short response contribution from the floor before we open up for uh, broader sort of questions uh, and discussion. And we're hoping to sort of wrap up the sort of formal part of the event by eight o'clock to give us uh, uh, plenty of time to have uh, some more informal conversations and things over a glass of wine, which usually makes that sort of thing a little bit easier. Um, so first, a few words of context uh, from, from me. Um, we are in the middle of a climate emergency, so we're not facing one, we're in the middle of one, and that much has been apparent for many years now, particularly to communities on the front line of the impacts of climate change mostly in the Global South. The IPCC's stark warning last year of how little time we have left to avoid breaching the very dangerous threshold of 1.5 degrees warming, the renewal of the climate movement with the emergence of the youth climate strikers and Extinction Rebellion has seen climate change rising up the political agenda at long last and announcements of climate emergency by the UK Parliament and the Scottish Government earlier this year signify um, that. <coughs> so, in announcing a climate emergency, the Scottish Government pledged to put that focus at the heart of its programme for government and its spending review this year. And while there are many welcome measures in this year's uh, programme for government, so published just last week, the reality is that it still falls very far short of an adequate response to the scale and depth of the crisis that we are in. And the elephant in the room, of course, is North Sea oil and gas. So if we fail to address the question of phasing out extraction of oil and gas, then we are failing to address the climate emergency. And while, interestingly, for the first time, the Scottish Government's support for oil and gas is conditional, it's conditional on the sector's actions to ensure a sustainable energy transition, which sounds very good. Uh, there is an inherent contradiction in the government statement, which still pledges support, not just for production, but for continued exploration of uh, oil and gas in the <coughs> North Sea. And there is nothing sustainable about going after ever more fossil fuels. And you'll hear more on this from Greg shortly, as this is a key focus of, of our sea change report. So the other key focus of our report is on just transition. A just transition is a term that's gaining a lot of political traction in the last few years with the imperative for a just transition enshrined in the Paris Agreement. And in Scotland, we're one of the first countries in the world to establish a wide-reaching just transition commission. This is something that Friends of the Air Scotland, with our trade union allies in the Just Transition Partnership, called for back in 2017, and we were very pleased to see that implemented by the Scottish Government. But just transition, of course, it's an idea that comes from the trade union movement. It's envisaged as a means of helping particularly industrial workers embrace the change that's necessitated by responding to environmental crises. And for Friends of the Earth, for oil change, for platform, it's an essential part of the response to the climate crisis. And Anna will say more about what this means in, in practice in terms of phasing out North Sea oil and gas extraction in a way that protects workers and the communities currently dependent on that industry. But I want to highlight one thing that just transition as a response to climate emergency has to involve. So the very idea of a, of a transition, just or otherwise, is that it takes place over a certain amount of time. And clearly for a transition to be just, it must involve processes and negotiations that involve the various stakeholders, particularly workers and communities. But climate science has given us the time frame over which that transition needs to happen. And it's basically the next decade, which is more than enough to get this right. So if there's the political will to do it, we can do this, but we must set a date for ending extraction of North Sea oil and gas. 
So I'm going to introduce and hand over to our speakers for this evening. Um, Greg Muttit is Head of Research at Oil Change International. Oil Change International is a research and advocacy group working to speed up the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. And Greg is going to talk about the imperative for phasing out oil and gas extraction in order to meet our commitments under the Paris Agreement and the subsidies that continue to prop that industry up and could be better deployed elsewhere. So over to you, Greg. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. It's a real pleasure to be here discussing an issue that is of particular importance to Scotland and to be sharing our, our research with you this evening. It's almost exactly, um, I, excuse me, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, it's, not, it's not a good evening for technology, obviously. Um, it's almost exactly 50 years since this drilling rig, the Sequest, uh, struck oil in the Montrose field about 150 miles east of Aberdeen, the first discovery of oil in, in the North Sea. The, what happened next, of course, is, is, a, is a, an important part of both Scotland's and the UK's as a whole industrial history. And one thing that's really remarkable about the story is it was only 16 years later that the UK was the world's fifth largest oil producer in 1985, 16 years from zero to one of the world's largest producers. Now, of course, um, that happened um, not in a vacuum, but with extensive support from governments of, of different political stripes during, during the period. The governments ensured the infrastructure was in place, they ensured there was training for the workforce, they worked to uh, secure the supply chain, and they provided the incentives for the companies to go through rapid development and, of course, the licensing process. They did so because they saw a strategic need to develop UK oil and gas quickly. This, of course, was the time of, of the uh, oil price crisis in the, in the 1970s. I think the most important part of, or the most important lesson from this for us today is that energy transitions can happen fast when there is a need for them to do so and a strategic interest from government in, in enabling them. 16 years it took to create a, uh, one of the world's largest oil, oil industries, oil and gas industries, and we need to see a similar level of urgency in relation to building the clean energies now. Um, this chart shows you uh, the, uh, how much oil and gas has been produced offshore the, of the UK uh, since that, that first discovery uh, in, in 1969 for oil and, and in gas slightly, slightly earlier. What you see here is that actually oil and gas production in the UK has peaked twice, first in the late 80s and secondly in, in around 2000. And, and today, it is growing again. Each time, the decline has been turned around by, again, an active government policy of ensuring finance, investing in technology, infrastructure, skills, and in particular, provision of new subsidies for, for oil and gas production. Most recently, there are the subsidies that were awarded in the 2015 and 2016 UK budgets. Now, oil, oil and gas licensing and regulation and the fiscal regime are reserved mat matters, governed from Whitehall and Westminster. Um, so why am I talking about it here? Well, the Scottish Government plays a supportive role in this, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of skills, and so on. It also plays an advocacy role in, in relation to the UK Government. This quote is from the Scottish Government's energy strategy of December 2017. Now, as Mary mentioned in, in the introduction, the programme for government last week seemed to suggest that ongoing Scottish Government support for maximising recovery of oil, oil and gas from the North Sea and, and, and other offshore areas is conditional on the industry going through a sustainable, secure, and inclusive energy transition. Now, in the research I'm sharing with you this evening, I want to, um, I, I want to give some indications as to what a, a sustainable, secure, and inclusive energy transition would involve. 
The, um, the policy, by the way, in the, in the title of this slide, um, uh, the policy both of the UK government and of the Scottish government is to maximise economic recovery. That doesn't mean maximise the economic benefits of oil and gas extraction, neither revenues nor jobs. It means maximising the extraction of any oil and gas that is economic to extract, i.e. commercially viable. It means squeezing out every last drop. And what I'm going to talk about is how that runs into the problem of climate limits. Climate change, of course, is a global problem. So in our research, we started from the global picture. As, you, as many of you probably know, uh, an oil or, oil or gas field commonly lasts for uh, 20 or more years of production. A coal mine very commonly for, for longer. Um, and oil and gas infrastructure such as pipelines also for longer, perhaps for 40 or 50 years. And so in our research, we looked at what would be the carbon dioxide emissions from the world's already producing oil fields, gas fields, and coal mines if, run, if operated for their full economic lives. So that, that's where the infrastructure has already been built and the capital has been invested and where there are, there are already jobs involved in extracting that oil, gas, and coal. So these are the emissions that are committed by reserves that are already developed in existing fields and mines. Uh, it comes to a bit more than um, a thousand gigatons of carbon dioxide over the economic life of those fields and mines. And so next we looked at how does this compare with the limits that, we, we, that are aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. What you see here is carbon budgets from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, that are aligned both with the 1.5 degree goal of the, of the Paris Agreement and with the two degree limit which the Paris Agreement requires governments to keep well below. As you can see, the already developed reserves of oil, gas and coal in the world, when combined with an optimistic assumption of how much uh, emissions will come from land use change and from uh, cement manufacture and other industrial process emissions, significantly exceeds what the world can afford to burn while keeping warming to 1.5 degrees and even exceeds what is, what is consistent with a two degree limit, what is now considered uh, a, a, a severely dangerous level of, of climate change. Now the implication of this is that any new oil, gas or coal fields or mines that are developed will add to the left hand column in this graph. And that logically can do one of two things. It can drive us further beyond climate limits, push the, the Paris goals further out of reach, or it can lead to some, proportion, some larger proportion of what's in that left-hand column not being fully extracted, the, which means that investors lose money, what's known as stranded assets, and people lose jobs in already operating fields and mines. A simple conclusion from this that I draw is that when you're in a hole, you should stop digging. Now, what, what I imagine one of the issues that may come up in the discussion here is what about carbon capture and storage? How would that change the picture here if not all of this um, oil, gas and coal actually leads to emissions of carbon dioxide if they are captured? Now, the three organizations in this, involved in this, in this report um, have slightly differing views on, um, on how we look at carbon capture and storage. I'll share my own view and perhaps others will come out in the discussion. But my own view is, and my organization's view is that we've seen for about 25 years, um, we've been told by the fossil fuel industry and by some governments that carbon capture and storage is just around the corner. It hasn't yet been delivered at scale. There are a, a two or three relatively small plants in operation worldwide and a, and a few much smaller <laughs> test, uh, test plants. Um, the way we look at it is if it becomes available, it could be a help, this is my organization, not necessarily all three organizations, it could be a helpful part of a solution to climate change, but only if it becomes available. And we shouldn't act now on the assumption that it will become available later on. That is an unknown for the future. Furthermore, if it does become available, it will be at most a part of the solution 
not all of the solution. There is no chance, and I, I don't believe anyone credibly says that carbon capture and storage might mean that we don't have to do anything to cut emissions. Let me illustrate that now. Most oil is used in transport applications for which carbon capture and storage is not, is not viable because they're mobile sources of emissions. It simply wouldn't be economically viable. If the challenges of lowering the costs of carbon capture and storage are overcome, it might perhaps be used in large-scale stationary sources of emissions, such as power stations and industrial plants. Now, my next slide, well, the, the variation on this slide is what would happen if CCS were applied to all of the world's power plants and industrial plants, and including cement manufacture, at the high end of what carbon capture and storage is able to deliver, which is capturing about 90% of emissions. How does that change our graph? If we achieve this, retrofit it to all of the world's power plants and industrial plants by tomorrow morning. Now, this is, of course, illustrative. Um, if we do it essentially instantaneously, this is how much it cuts off the left-hand column of the graph. Now, it doesn't change the oil picture because the oil is, is primarily used in transport. Of course, we're not going to do this by tomorrow morning. And, so, and what we see in this is that the left-hand column still exceeds the 1.5 degree carbon budget. The, in, in any process of applying carbon and capture and storage, of course, it will take time. And so, in fact, the left-hand column will end up significantly larger. Now, what does, it, what does all of this mean for, for Scotland and the UK? So going back to where we were before, the UK has um, about 6 billion barrels of, of oil and gas equivalent uh, in currently producing fields, so already in this left-hand column. It is the ambition of the UK and Scottish governments and of the industry to extract 20 billion barrels, so three times as much as the UK already has in this left-hand column. That is illustrated in this next, um, in this next slide. What you see in the, in the gray portions is the natural decline as existing fields are depleted, a projection of, of what emissions will occur from that oil and gas over the next um, 30 years out to 2050. As you see, it is a, uh, a process of, of gradual decline over that period. Now, we, when we look at this, we, we see that we, there are two options here. One option is to recognize that there is already too much oil, gas, and coal, or already too much committed emissions relative to the Paris goals, and so we need to stop adding to it. We recommend a managed phase-out of oil and gas extraction, something like the grey portion here. What the oil and gas industry would like to see is continued expansion, continued maximizing recovery, which includes the pink portions here coming from new oil and gas fields which are yet to be developed and in many cases yet even to be licensed. Now the trouble is that one thing we can be fairly confident of is that climate impacts will worsen over time and with them the political urgency of acting on climate change. If we continue on the current course, we can anticipate, anticipate ever intensifying climate policy to try and get us back on course. Again, I'm going to show you an illustration of what that might look like. The carbon budget at current rates for a 1.5 de degree of warming is little more than 10 years of current emissions. We're looking at less than five, 500 billion tons of, of carbon dioxide, and the world is currently emitting about 40 billion tons every year. So the carbon budgets, if no action is taken, could be depleted in about 10 or 12 years. What happens if at that stage worldwide cl climate policy moves to um, address the problem? What we have there is what we call a deferred collapse. And this for the Scottish economy and for Scottish communities and for Scottish jobs would be disastrous. Given a choice between a managed phase-out or a deferred collapse, we would advocate a managed phase-out. Now, I'm, I'm just going to do uh, share two last things with you um, before handing over to Anna. The first is, what does the oil industry say about this? Now, the the oil industry's lobby group, Oil and Gas UK, plays a remarkably central role 
in debates about the future of oil and gas, including on climate change, for an interest group. Um, and last week, they released what they called their roadmap to 2035, which is their plan for maximizing extraction of oil and gas out to 35 out to 2035. Remarkably, they called it a blueprint for net zero. So more oil and gas will help us get to zero emissions. Um, it, it takes a while to get your head around. I, I have read the roadmap, and, and this is the essence of the argument. Oil and gas will continue to be needed even after there, is net, there are net zero emissions. Um, because there will be some form of negative emissions sucking carbon dioxide out of the year, out, out of the atmosphere. Um, interestingly, when you read their roadmap, they say what they're aiming for is limiting global warming to less than two degrees C. That's the Copenhagen target of, of 10 years ago. They seem not to have updated that to the Paris goals of well below two degrees C and, and pursuing efforts for 1.5 degrees C. They say the, the, UK, the UK offshore, the North Sea, will become a, a net zero emissions oil and gas basin and will deliver lower carbon intensity than other sources. Now, just to illustrate those last two, um, this is a typical barrel of 40s uh, 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 crude. And where do the emissions come from? They come from extraction processes, refining processes, and then ultimately combustion of the oil. What the industry is proposing is getting as close to zero as possible of the brown portion at the top of this, the extraction process emissions, while maximizing the number of total barrels which are represented by the whole. Um, while what that says to me is that is uh, not net zero in relation to the whole, it is net zero in relation to a small fraction of the whole. Now, what about the claim that the, U the, the UK provides less carbon intensive oil than other countries? Well, that's where the UK sits in a range of, of world, the world's different uh, sources of oil by carbon intensity, so uh, somewhere a bit above the middle. One thing you see is that the difference in carbon intensity between oils is relatively minor compared to the total emissions from each. Well, the mo most of the UK's remaining imports come from Norway, uh, which are those green arrows there. So some of the Norwegian oil is similar carbon intensity, but some of it's a lot lower. And that's about half of the UK's imports. Uh, most of the rest comes from uh, Nigeria, Algeria, and the US, which are spread over the map. It's not true that the UK is lower carbon intensity oil than others. The final thing I, I want to say a little bit about is how could we fund an energy transition? Now, what this slide shows you is, is 10 of the largest oil and gas companies operating in the, in, the, in the UK offshore, in the North Sea. How much did they pay in net taxes, i.e. taxes minus subsidies, to the government over the years 2015 to 2017? As you can see, in all of these 10 cases, the number was negative. Even though these companies were making, in some cases, very large profits, they were, pay, they were receiving hundreds of billions of pounds from the taxpayer. What this says to me is there is a large amount of money here that could be redirected to enabling a transition. And so I'm just going to finish with what, what was in last week's programme for the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government will continue to support oil and gas extraction in the North Sea if it is part of a sustainable, secure and inclusive energy transition. My interpretation of this research is that a sustainable, secure and inclusive energy transition can only be achieved through a managed phase-out of oil and gas extraction offshore the UK.